Okay. There I am on Facebook. Let's wait just a moment for a few people to join us. I'm going to be talking this morning about the Scrum values a little bit. We, we dropped our Scrum Foundations video on the Scrum values this week and then answering some questions that we've gotten through email and you know, even in class this week and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, as new questions come up, feel free to comment on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or whatever, and we're watching those. and. We'll address those questions or topics, whatever you're interested in. So this week I had my last class of the year. I did a CSPO class here in, in Denver. And as I wrapped that up on Wednesday, thinking back over the whole year and what what themes I've heard, how this year was different, what, I was thinking about what kind of impact I'm having. And one of the themes that came to mind is how many times I've had conversations with uh, with people who are, are new to Agile and attending a, one of our classes for the first time and with some longtime clients that I've been working with for you know, five, six, or, or more years. And, and that's this theme of how this applies beyond work. That people keep telling me something they learned in class, they took home and it, it changed some conversation they had with a spouse or, or their kids or with a friend. Or people are applying agile principles and values, even using some of the practices in their home. Um, last year, uh, my family made a video, uh, it's up on the Agile for All website, about how we use Agile at home for, oh, let's see, I've got, my two older boys are in 11th grade now, so since kindergarten, so about 12 years, we've been doing homeschool and chores and kind of managing our whole house using uh, a bit of Scrum, a bit of Kanban. We've got a, a board set up in our laundry room where our three boys and and my wife and I keep track of the things that we need to do. And then every day and throughout the day, everybody checks the board and um, finds the things that they want to do next and so that we can get everything done that we need to get done. And it's just been a great way to teach our kids uh, how to self-organize, how to control their own day and make decisions about what they want to do. And it's built good responsibility. And for us, it's kind of decoupled the work that needs to be done from us having to tell them to do it, which has been really nice. We're not chasing them around saying, like, are you going to take out the trash? It's like, look at the board and, and see whose turn it is to take out the trash. And then uh, if they don't want to do it, it's really the board that they're upset at, not us. And uh, it's built some good habits. And now that our, our boys are in high school, um, they're managing a lot of this themselves. Yeah, so uh, I've been talking over that with clients, and then I've been hearing their own stories about how they're applying a lot of this at home. And and I think that that sort of gets to our topic this week. Uh, we posted this video about the Scrum values, and I, if you look at the list of values, you know, commitment, focus, openness, respect, courage. It doesn't really sound like anything particularly work-related uh, or anything certainly software or product development related. Those are really just you know, things you could value as a human in a lot of contexts. Uh, <clears throat> a question I often get when I talk about the Scrum values in, in my classes or in my coaching is what does it even mean for a process framework like Scrum to have values? 
Like, you know, we can kind of understand a person or, or maybe an organization, like a collection of people having values. But what does it mean for something like Scrum to have values? And I, I think there's two sides to it. Uh, first, I think Scrum itself, you know, in, in having those values, Scrum is optimized to give you more of those things. Like it, if you want to see more commitment, focus, openness, respect, courage in your work, uh, Scrum is kind of designed to be a, a tool for that. You know, things like having clear roles, working in short iterations, uh, having a dedicated team that's collaborating around a goal. Like those things will produce more of these values. So if you value those things already, then it makes sense to set up your work so that you're more likely to get those things than to get other things. It becomes easier to do the right thing than the wrong thing. And we'll, I'll talk in a moment about each of the five and, and how I see Scrum enabling you to, to live out those more. I, I think the other side of it, so, so there's the Scrum being optimized to give you more of those things. And then the other side of it is that Scrum works better when it's being used by people who value those things. So if, if you care about commitment or focus, you're going to be more effective using the tool than you would otherwise be if those things weren't important to you. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, <clears throat> Scrum is designed to allow a team to not get interrupted all the time. You know, they decide in sprint planning, these are the things we're going to work on because they're the most important things we could work on. And we're going to block out all the things that could distract us as much as we can so that we can focus on those things. And I know on you know, one of the early Scrum teams, the, they adopted Scrum because management was coming to the team every day and changing their mind and saying, hey, stop working on that, start working on this. And so Scrum was a way to say, we value focus, so we need to carve out some space for ourselves to focus. And I, I think anybody can relate to this as you're trying to complete a task. If you keep having email notifications pop up or people walk into your office and, and distract you, it, that's going to have an effect on not just your focus, but your ability to get anything done. So Scrum is designed to have this space where you can focus, where you actually can get something done. And the dedicated team, the sprint, the rule about like generally keeping the sprint backlog stable, those are designed to support focus. So that's the optimized for that. But the other half of it is if you don't care about focus, like if you're going into that sprint with the sense that, yeah, focus is fine, but we could work on whatever, you're likely to let yourself get interrupted or interrupt yourself and distract yourself. And you're not going to see that benefit that's built into Scrum of, being able to focus and get things done. Now, of course, there are situations where a team is working on both product delivery and also dealing with support, and they're going to get interrupted. And even here, this value of focus helps because instead of just saying, we're going to take all the interruptions because we have to, uh, maybe you do have to, you know, if a production system is down, you, you have to take care of that. But if you value focus, you can ask each other, like, what is a good way to structure our process so that we still get this focus we care about, but we also have the ability to deal with the biggest emergencies? And so you might adopt something like an expedite lane on your board where emergencies can jump in ahead of your plans, but you're really strict about if it's an emergency, we're going to treat it like an emergency. So we're not going to scramble the sprint backlog every day but we will put out fires when we have to, and then we'll return our attention to the things we want to focus on. And maybe something falls off the bottom of our sprint backlog, but we're not just letting things kind of randomly get added and dropped. We're, we're valuing focus as much as we can. Now, of the five values, the, the one that I is most interesting or, or sometimes most puzzling to me is, is this value of courage. Uh, it, it seems like we probably shouldn't have to have courage at work. <laughs> like something may be wrong if doing the right thing at work is scary and requires courage in some way. Uh, 
Um, but I think this is a place where Scrum is kind of honest about what is the real world like. It's not the, just this in a perfect world. You know, sometimes I get these questions in classes that begin, yeah, that's great, but in the real world, and, and by real world, they mean in my messed up context where I can't imagine things being any different. Um, and, and I think acknowledging that courage is a value uh, acknowledges that r reality isn't ideal, that there are things in organizations that cause it to not feel safe to do the right thing, like saying no to that interruption that really isn't worth breaking focus for. It's not really an emergency. It's just somebody had some idea and wants the team to start working on their idea instead of what they were doing already. And it may require courage on the part of a product owner or scrum master or even a developer to say, um, we'd love to do that thing. And the mechanism for getting that to our team is getting it into the top of the product backlog. But right now we've committed, you know, so there's that commitment value. We, we've committed to focus on this set of things and we want to get those done. So there's some courage required there. My, my hope and what I see in my more successful clients that I've been working with for years is that the, the need for courage around things like that goes away. And over time, everybody builds good habits to where it doesn't require courage to say, you know, we're going to focus right now. But that doesn't make the value of courage go away. It just allows you to use it for bigger things. So then it becomes we're going to use some courage to try some crazy experiment with our process. Yeah. We're going to courageously take a risk on something in the market and build a new feature or, or you know, try out a possible new product idea, even when we don't really know it's going to work. So then courage is going towards how can we innovate? How can we deliver more value? How can we work better and better rather than, and just applying it day to day and trying to focus and do the right thing. So those those five scrum values have turned out to be more useful um, than I expected when I first got into this stuff. Now, I had a question related to this uh, on Twitter about trust um, and trust and respect and openness between members of the same scrum team and between the scrum team and the rest of the world. And trust intersects nicely with a lot of these values. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, I define trust as the belief that you're not going to harm me or you're going to maybe even do good for me. Right? So if I don't trust you, I believe that somehow you're going to do something that hurts me. And the most common way this shows up in organizations is when you promise me something. I don't believe you're actually going to follow through on your promise. So if that's your track record, or maybe sometimes if that's my track record with other people that I, I, I've been burned on that, I may not have high trust for you or your team. So how do you build trust? Well, you build trust by reliably not harming me or, or doing good to me in, in everything you say or do. And so one of the things Scrum lets individuals, teams, and even organizations do is build trust relatively quickly because of the small cycles, you know, the daily cycle in the team from daily Scrum to the next daily Scrum, um, the sprint cycle of planning to review and retro, um, and then larger perhaps cycles of you know, quarters, years, releases, you know, things that wrap around Scrum. You have this opportunity to make plans and make promises and then follow through on them and build trust by doing that. So sometimes people in my classes, especially in, in uh, product under classes, they really want to have a bigger impact on what sorts of things their team work on, their team works on. Um, so they'll have this sense that our, our strategy isn't the right one, but somebody further up in the organization, maybe somewhat removed from customers these days, wants us to go in a particular direction and it doesn't seem right. And so the question I get is sometimes, uh, how can I change their mind or how can I get my team to do something different? And my advice to them is that you don't start there. Scrum gives us this 
the system for building trust and you, you start small. You, know, you start with the sprint, just becoming reliable. So even if you don't think you have the right things in your sprint backlog, you can say, well, we're going to at least deliver the things that we said we would do reliably. So we're going to plan and you know, two weeks from now, if we're running a two week sprint, you're going to get pretty much what we talked about. Now, if it's complex, some of the details will emerge as we're doing the work, but pretty much the goals we set for ourselves are the ones we achieve a couple weeks later. And you do this for a while, and sometimes it's only two, three, four sprints of doing that reliably before people around the team start trusting you more. And then you have this ability to influence what's on the top of the backlog and how it's structured. And say, you know, we, we see this opportunity in this other area. Customers are asking for this thing. Could we sneak in a feature or user story about that? And usually you've built enough trust by being reliable that you're able to do that. And then you do that, you ship it, you see positive feedback, that builds even more trust. And now your influence grows a little bit more. And now you're able to say, well, maybe we should start rethinking our strategy and taking on some bigger things in a different direction. You know, maybe you you build the ability to have different kinds of conversations with your stakeholders, but you didn't do it by jumping straight there. You did it by using this ability to focus and keep commitments and show openness by being transparent about what you're doing. So back to those scrum values, um, you, you did that in a small way, which built trust and gave you more influence. You did it again there, built trust, gave you more influence, and, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, so if you don't have high trust, you need to do something to build that. And you don't do it by just deciding you're going to trust each other. You do it by finding small ways to do good rather than harm and prove that you're trustworthy. Now, a related question that I get, uh, again, particularly in product owner classes, is should the product owner be at the retrospective? And I think this conversation about the values and about trust helps us answer that. And when I talk with people who advocate that the product owner shouldn't be at the retro or is optional at the retro, and we dig into it, what we usually find out is that they don't want the product owner there because the rest of the team won't feel comfortable being vulnerable and talking about how they could grow when the product owner's in the room. Like maybe there's some kind of organizational power thing there where the product owner is a VP in the business or something, and the developers on the team don't want to say, you know, we're really struggling with our testing, and they want to be able to have this kind of positive front towards their product owner that says we can deliver reliably. And and I totally get that, um, but if your reason for not having your product owner in your retrospective is that the team and the product owner don't sufficiently trust each other to have a real conversation about improvement, guess what your team's constraint is? Guess what you should be talking about in your retro? It's that. And that, that's the thing that is probably most limiting your effectiveness at a team. So you could exclude the product owner and that becomes kind of a band-aid on the symptom and then you're not actually dealing with the core issue. You're kind of fine-tuning something that's not your core issue. Or you can get the product owner in the room and you can have that difficult conversation of why don't we feel comfortable? What can we do to get more comfortable working together? Sometimes this sort of thing feels like too much for a Scrum Master to facilitate, um, either because the Scrum Master has too much skin in the game and really wants to be part of the conversation and can't be impartial as a facilitator, or because they're new to facilitating and, and this kind of potentially emotionally charged thing feels difficult. And in that case, it's, it's not a problem to get a third party facilitator. You know, maybe that's somebody from the outside. Um, maybe that's just another scrum master. And some of our clients, um, pairs of scrum masters have agreements with each other that when one of them doesn't feel comfortable facilitating, they can call on the other one to come facilitate with their team. So they have some familiarity with the team, uh, some trust already there, but they're still sufficiently outside the system so they can facilitate objectively. And so that's something you might do in a situation like this. Um, but I would say 
the product owner is pretty much required at the retrospective because they are part of the team. And if you're going to have a team that has you know, respect and openness and commitment and focus and all these things together, it takes all the roles doing it together. And if you're not comfortable doing that, that's time to look at that issue. Let's move on from the, the Scrum values for now. And, and let's talk a little bit about uh, my favorite topic, the thing that gets most of the traffic I see on our website to my stuff, um, which is splitting big things into small things. You know, project into features, features into stories, big stories into small stories. Um, this might feel like a different topic, but it's actually more related than you might think. And it comes back to that being trustworthy and reliable kind of thing. That if you can break your work into small increments of value, it becomes much easier to show that your team is delivering value, which is going to build trust, which is going to increase your influence, which is ultimately going to increase your impact. And it makes it easier to be open and focus. So, for example, if you've got a team that has divided their work up into really technical, architectural kind of pieces, a lot of your conversations with your stakeholders in the sprint review or otherwise are going to be along the lines of, no, we're still working on it. We're 80% we're done. Or we finished the you know, such and such service, but we can't really show it to you because it's not in the user interface yet. You know, things like that, which really don't build trust, they just leverage whatever trust you already have. So if you want to build trust, you need this way to be able to be transparent in a way that makes sense to your stakeholders. And the single best way I know of to do that is to make sure that your work is organized around things that your stakeholders care about, like real increments of value. So I think being able to work in these small slices of value at every level of detail, features, stories, even within stories, um, I think that's the the key habit for Agile teams to be effective. It enables so many other things. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're you're new to this stuff, um, go to agileforall.com slash splitting dash user dash stories, splitting user stories. You'll find the landing page to pretty much all of my story splitting stuff. And it even now, I have some of the stuff is 10 years old. Um, and continues to be relevant and continues to account for nearly half the traffic to the website. So people everywhere are struggling with this. If you are, um, don't worry, you're not unusual. It's a common thing. But what's great about the story splitting skill is that it's more learnable than almost any other skill I've seen people use in their work. And you think about your core skills at work, uh, whether that's software development, product management, facilitation, whatever it is that you do, you probably took hundreds or thousands of hours to get that skill. Most of the teams that I've coached around story splitting went from zero to 60, like basically nothing to I see something big and I say, oh yeah, I know how to split that, we've done that before, uh, in about two and a half hours of practice. And so if you go to that splitting user stories landing page on our website, you'll see a link to how do you structure that practice? And it'll walk you through, you know, like here's three different practice sessions where here's the kind of thing you want to bring to it. Here's how you practice. And reliably, I've seen teams go from, I have no idea how to do this to, okay, that's easy. We can do that anytime with that focus practice. Yeah. I don't know many other skills that are that learnable in about three hours. Uh, so check that out. Uh, related, we had a question come in a moment ago. Uh, have you seen times when something can't be broken down into small increments of value? If so, in which situations might this occur? When I wrote the original Patterns for Splitting Stories uh, post on the blog in, I think it was 2008, um, so almost a decade ago, I ended it with a challenge to bring me the unsplittable software story. And we've had some candidates over the years. Uh, I've looked at many hundreds of, of stories with my clients and with people who've just emailed me after reading the blog. And I've literally not found an unsplittable software story. I've found many where somebody didn't know how to do it. Uh, from time to time, we find some that are 
not splittable into units of value because the team structure prevents that. Like you have teams that are sliced up by architecture. You know, there if you've got a team that only delivers changes to a database and users don't use the database directly, yeah, there, there's no increment of value that team can deliver that's going to be directly meaningful to a user. Um, but assuming you have a fully cross-functional team that can actually deliver value, I haven't found a story that couldn't be split in some way. Uh, we came across one at one of my clients that wasn't worth splitting. <laughs> so or it wasn't worth splitting in the usual way. Uh, that one was um, for a network security appliance. They, they got a new network card and needed to port the driver from the old network card to the new network card. Um, that was what the Kinevin complexity model would call a complicated problem. Like you could analyze and spec out exactly how to deliver the thing. And there was a pretty natural sequence to deliver it in. So trying to make the network driver work in small increments as you know, complete slices of network behavior didn't really make sense. It made sense in that case to slice it up in a little bit more of a, a task architectural kind of way you know, because they'd done it so many times before and it was just another one of those. Um, but for any reasonably complex work, um, we get a lot of value from having small increments early and often. Uh, now, we mentioned the team structure situation that prevents this. Uh, sometimes what prevents it is that people have already broken up the work into things that are not actually user stories, though they may call them that. Um, they're really tasks or components pretending to be stories. So sometimes the thing that looks unsplittable when it comes to me is you know, make this change to a database, make this change to a middle tier, something like that. Uh, and in those cases, before we can come up with a good slice, we need to combine the bad slice with its friends, <laughs> with the other pieces that together would make a good slice of value. Now, of course, this makes it bigger. So we have to go bigger before we can go smaller, but we need to do it in a different direction. We need to put those architectural pieces back together. And now we have something that maybe it went from two weeks of work to six weeks of work and people get scared at that point. Uh, but don't worry, once we put it back together, now we can look at those story splitting patterns and we can say, you know, does it have a workflow? Does it have business rules? Does it have different operations? All those different things and, and start slicing in a more vertical direction through layers of architecture. And if this is something you're still struggling with, you've done some of the practice, you've used the resources I've got on the website, and you're still stuck, uh, I'm totally happy to take tweets or emails about this and walk through it with you. Uh, because this skill, this habit of small vertical slices is so important and so transformative uh, that I love helping people through it, even if you're not a paying client, you're not in a class, I, I still want to help you with this because it's important to me. Uh, so you can contact me through our website. You can contact me on Twitter at RS Lawrence, and I would love to talk with you about your hard to split stories. Um, but first try to use the free resources on the website because that compiles a lot of people's experience over the last decade. And there's no reason not to benefit from that. Let's talk about, let's see, one more thing here, um, unless any other questions come in uh, in the meantime, and that's backlog refinement, and when do you do it? Uh, so I've, I've tweeted before the, that I believe you need a backlog refinement or backlog grooming meeting like you need a programming meeting. You need a backlog grooming meeting about as much as you need a programming meeting. And as I talk with people, I don't know anybody who has a programming meeting, um, except maybe teams that do mob programming, which is great. Uh, but I don't know anybody who sets aside two hours on Thursday afternoon to gather around and do the programming for the sprint. Uh, people just do it continuously. It's the work. And to do the work, they get help from other people. And in my experience, backlog refinement is the same thing. It's, it's a mirror of what a developer is doing when they work on the product. And it's just the product owner's responsibility to end up with a good backlog at all levels of detail. And to do that job, they need help. They need to collaborate with other people. And so I recommend that the product owner 
take ownership of this and then every day connect with the people that they need to get the job done. Now, the obvious place for this is the daily scrum. And so we're back to another one of these, should the product owner be there questions. Uh, I think of the scrum team as a team that works together to meet some shared goals. And so the product owner is part of that team. And if the daily scrum is the time where the whole team plans their day and figures out how are we going to make today matter, well, part of that is looking ahead and getting the backlog in good shape for the future. So I like to see the product owner come to the daily scrum and say things like, I've got this new user story I've added near the top of the backlog. Uh, here's what it's about. I could use some help from somebody on the team to split this because it seems like it's pretty big. Um, who's the right person to do this, and when is a good time. And then that just becomes part of the plan for the day. It, it doesn't need to be a meeting where everybody does everything. And there's really only two things that require the whole team when it comes to dealing with the backlog, and that's estimating. You know, if you're going to do some kind of estimating, however you do that, um, everybody should own it. And then committing to a sprint backlog. And everything else we can do with smaller groups. So a couple people could go away, help split that story, and then come back the next morning and say, okay, we split that one into these four smaller ones. We need to get some sizes on this. So can we take a few minutes after our daily scrum today and do a quick round of estimating? However we do that, I really don't care. Uh, and then we're, we're done. And then we do a little bit more the next day and a little bit more the next day. And so it's, it's more continuous backlog refinement than backlog refinement as a meeting. All right. Any other questions or topics I can answer from the people who are online? All right, in that case, we're going to wrap it up here. Next Friday, my colleague Trisha Broderick is going to be on. So think about what you want to ask her and get that up on Facebook and Twitter in advance. And we'll see you next week. Have a great week.